Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Schwab Coaching. It's our Monday edition of Trader Talk in today's market. I'm your host, Kevin Horner. I want to thank you all for joining me today. I am lucky to be joined by my friend and Schwab Regional Investment Strategist, Jeffrey Abelos. Hey, Jeff, great to see you on this Monday. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. Great to see you as well. Happy April Fool's Day to all the viewers out there. I will be in our Chandler branch a little bit later this morning and can't wait for the wonderful surprise I have for all of them. How are you doing, big guy? Well, you know, not much better than having a couple of fools host on April Fool's <laughs> Fool to get us started off, right? Uh, so we're going to get going on that. Uh, listen, everybody, we are here to try to kind of break down the charts with you all this morning. We've obviously been participating in one heck of a market move. We're going to look at the major markets for you all today. We're going to hit up a couple of uh, notable sectors. There's a lot of sectors that are working well, a lot of bullish charts showing up on our, on our um, overall look at the market, and we're going to get to those as well. But today, we are going to talk about a specific learning objective. We're going to get back into the discussion around stops, traditional stops versus trailing stops and how traders might employ them. We've got opportunities within our example portfolio to highlight these dis this discussion specifically. And so that's going to be our final 15 minutes today, everybody. We're going to get to that kind of kind of walking you through a discussion of what uh, traders are considering when thinking about employing traditional stops versus trailing stops. And we're going to talk about some of those mechanics with you. So make sure we have that uh, pinned for the final 15 minutes of the discussion today, everybody. Now, before we get into it, let's remind you all of our important disclosures. As always, our conversation is exclusively informational and educational, meaning simply we do not make recommendations. Any expression of opinion is subject to change without notice. We talk a lot about technical analysis here. It's important to remember Remember, technical analysis should be considered complementary in nature to your fundamental research, not to be relied upon exclusively on its own. Further, bear in mind that when we're working here with you all in our uh, Think or Swim desktop application, we are doing so in a demonstration or paper money mode. All that means simply is we want you to rely on live data when making your own decisions. So be sure that you are in a live session uh, attaining, obtaining rather news that is pertinent and um, valid. So we encourage you to be utilizing live session details when you are making those decisions. Okay. All right. And so as we often do here in Trader Talk, we get started with that broad market review, looking at the various trends. What are some of the relationships that we can take from those trends and moves? And like I said, we're going to hit our final 15 minutes with our example portfolio and the discussion on stops and trailing stops. So with that, let's move on over to the Think or Swim desktop application. We'll get started as we do with the S&P 500. Jeff, are you bored yet, sir? <laughs> It's tough to get bored when you've got so much to say about the bullishness of the market. I mean, I, I'm sure you're in the same camp as I am where you found that, what was it, about the, probably about the last two years, I think a lot of the viewers out there would agree. Last two years, the talk was when recession, when recession, when recession. And then you kind of had some weakness through different parts. But I think for the most part, what a lot of traders are looking at right now as we're identifying this chart in front of us is a lot of bullishness out there. Sure, last week you had a few days where you said things were pulling back a little bit. I could agree with you on that. But again, remember, as the saying and adage goes, the trend is your friend until it bends. And that's when it ends. You had a little bit of a pullback. I would not say that it certainly bent, and I don't think that there would be anybody out there who could say that it is broken by any stretch of the imagination. So it seems like it's just more of the same from a lot of traders' perspective, Kevin. What are you thinking? I'm thinking very much the same, to be quite honest. Uh, the the reminder we're offered, I think, Jeff, is uh, the as you stated, the trend is is your friend until it breaks. Uh, we tend as traders and, and investors alike, we're human, so we can make easy mistakes. One of those mistakes is utilizing a fear uh, factor as opposed to true, what, truly what's happening. And so, Jeff, bringing us all back to the same thought process, right? The What matters most in the way of a trend, Jeff? Price, right? And so if we pay attention to price and simply rely on price to dictate our approach to whether we stay fully invested in our positions in the S&P 500 or we start to pare back on those based on our tolerance for, for coming risk, uh, you know, the truth of the matter is, Jeff, here we reside just yesterday, Friday, excuse me, Thursday, rather, with Friday being a holiday, we did make a new intraday high yet again, 52.64. We're pretty close to it today once more. but. 
you know what? If you've just simply been a robot all along the way and allowed price action to dictate whether you stayed fully invested or pulled a little off, chances are you'd be in the majority of your position simply by the use of the 20-day moving average in orange there, Jeff. We've had very yeah. infrequent uh, breaks of that level. What about this? I got a question for you, Kevin, because you often see this happen in the market. You see this happen with traders out there. They go, well, the trend has gone on for so long now. What if I get in and then it immediately starts to turn down? Should I even look at taking on a new position at this point in time? It's a fair question to ask, of course, because I know that there are many of our viewers out there who are wondering, should I be deploying more money here? Uh, this is a great question. Let's talk about it a little bit. First, I, I would say, if you're simply reliant on the pattern and the trend, some traders would tell you it's perfectly fine to deploy new money here with the caveat being that you've already defined where you'd say, you know what, maybe I was a little bit wrong on that and I would want to move on. Uh, for some traders, Jeff, you know, there's a visual on this chart. I'm going to zoom into the last few months here, everybody. And if I put a line equal to where we seem to be butting our heads there for a little bit, Look at where that coincides now, Jeff. We got a little bit of confluence here at about 51.75, 5,175 points on the SPX. Now, this is getting a little bit more detailed to your question, but ultimately, I guess, Jeff, the question should be, it would be a move beneath 51.75 that would give a trader maybe belief that this trend is taking a little bit of a pause at least, right? I mean, we haven't seen that. We haven't had a move below the 20-day since all the way back in January, mid-January 17. So at least that might be for some traders, Jeff, the spot where they would say, you know, maybe I should take a little off, whether that be new dollars deployed or money that's still invested from the beginning of the trend, right? So that's where I'm at. But what about you? What are uh, Maybe there's another uh, time frame of a trader who would use a different level perhaps. Could be. Yeah. Remember, if you're using a different time zone, let's say you're, I shouldn't say time zone, time period is probably <laughs> the better, better term there. But if you're using a different time period, what you're going to look at might be a little bit different than what Kevin and I are seeing this morning. Now, I will say for a lot of us out there, we've had this experience happen from, what is it, a couple Thursdays ago, you had those nice big green candles. Sure enough, somebody probably got in and then they saw a red day, red day, red day, red day. And that oh, can yeah. be very debilitating. But let's say you did get in on that big up movement. If your thesis was, I am not going to get out unless we see a break and close below that 20 period simple moving average, you would still be in this trade. Sure, you'd have four days that didn't feel too great, but you are still in this trade and you are now back in the black. So you're making some money on it. So I think for mm -hmm. the viewers out there who are wondering, do I get in now? Do I not get in now? I don't know when the perfect time to get in or not is, but what you do want to follow is a strict set of rules. And if your rules say, I do not exit this trade until a break and close below the 20 day simple moving average, then you now have yourself a process. And I've found in my career and in my trading, it's best to follow that process. Yeah, having, a, having that plan, having that process can absolutely benefit the trader. Uh, no doubt about it. We talk quite a bit about that here. Uh, I. I apologize to everybody. I should have mentioned we do have Brent Moores in the chat today, everyone. Please feel free to not just engage with Brent, but post your specific questions in the chat as well as Brent is mentioning these so that we are uh, giving you all some insights as to what we're looking at here. Thanks, Brent, for uh, for answering these questions and certainly for giving some context. Yeah, and when we're looking at these moving averages, um, just to give you all some of you newer viewers who maybe don't join us, or have yet to join us on a daily basis, but that 20-day moving average is the one we show in orange. Beneath it, the purple is our 50-day moving average, and our blue moving average down below is the 200-day. And again, these aren't the ones that you should be using per se. These are the ones that a lot of traders do rely on. Uh, these are fairly standardized. That does not mean that they have to be used by you and as a trader. And you can always incorporate moving averages that fit the positions you're trading uh, maybe a little bit more closely. Last week, if you were with us, and maybe you want to check this out in the archives, uh, I think I had Cam on. Uh, Cam is on. Cameron May is on with me on Tuesdays, and we've made an adjustment to the 20-day moving average, Jeff, to the 30-day the mm -hmm. moving average. And you noticed uh, here we've had only a couple of deviations below the 20-day, but it's pretty interesting when you look at the 30, Jeff, how the 30 has not had a close below it at all since it was right. recaptured back here on November 2nd. So we've had tests of the 30-day, but a trader, Jeff, who was using the 30-day every step, 
has had no reason to take any movement of position off the table. They've just kind of stuck with the trade, and that trader's probably pretty happy, Jeff. They might have gotten long somewhere in the neighborhood of 43, 43 and a quarter, and they're up nearly 900 points, or maybe more than 900 points if I can do my math properly. Then, well, that's not too bad. Now, question for you, Kevin. What if somebody says, well, I've, I've always been using the 20 day. Should I now switch to the 30 day mm. because it was brought up last week? What are your thoughts on that? I'm just uh, curious on what you're thinking. Well, I mean, I, I'm a believer that if you began your trade with a risk tolerance using a specific moving average, you want to stick to that probably. Uh, you okay. can always speed up a moving average, Jeff. I think it's kind of akin to the conversation we have around whether we should raise stop. Uh, excuse me. I have a stop order set. Do I del- do I remove or delete or, excuse me, reduce the stop price, right? Can I push the stop price lower? And I think when you're thinking about moving averages, it's perfectly fine to adjust to a shorter i.e., or that is to say, faster moving average, right? Because now you're capturing maybe the momentum of a given move. So if you change from a 20-day to a 5-day, for example, because you've had a very quick spike, that makes sense for some traders because that allows them to capitalize on that recent move. But I don't know about changing horses midstream, Jeff. I mean, I I tend to lean into the idea that I started with this. I want to stick with it until something changes, If that something changes, sure, go to that speedier moving average, but maybe not the longer one. Meaning, if you go to a longer moving average, Jeff, what are you ultimately doing but giving up more price? Right, because you're loosening, essentially. In in most cases, you're going to be loosening up that stop or that exit plan. And that can sometimes be pretty devastating. I know that when you try to change up the exit strategy midway through the trade, as you were saying, that can have Mm -hmm. some pretty dramatic effects. It can. And and I'm a fan of making adjustments along the way. It's, it shows uh, not uh, uh, an ongoing learning process, Jeff, but at the same time, again, have a reason that's good for it, right? I mean, if, if you're giving yourself a wider berth, it might be because you wanted to sell off of some of your existing position. And there, therefore, now where you had 100 shares to start and you were working with the 20-day moving average, you said, you know what? I'm going to cut half of that. I'm going to only own 50 shares. But now I'm going to work with the 50-day moving average because I can afford to give it a wider berth, Jeff, because I own fewer Mm -hmm. shares. And now my true dollars at risk are fewer because I have half the position size. So there's always a way to consider it. You can always talk through it. And it's a great reminder, Jeff, you and I were on the phones for a very long time as representatives. We spoke to clients all day long about this stuff. Yeah, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but those were the best conversations we've ever had. I loved them. I absolutely loved them. And I still, I love getting to do that. And, I, and now I'm doing it in a branch setting where I'm in mm-hmm. face-to-face, which is which is sometimes great and sometimes can be a little bit challenging. But yeah, I do like to have that conversation. I'll give you an example real quick, Kevin. I was talking to a client the other day and they were starting to get into trading and they go, well, what moving averages should I use? And there really is no right or wrong answer. But one thing I did bestow upon them was I think a lot of traders out there look at the 20, the 50, and the 200. I think it's just Mm -hmm. a very common usage of the moving average segments. I'm not saying that that's what you have to use, but generally speaking, I wanna see what everybody else sees. And so if I'm looking at a chart or if a trader is looking at a chart and they have those on there, that's just letting me know that they are taking a look at what everybody else out there is viewing. And so not a bad idea to say, well, I'm just gonna use what's most popular. In that circumstance, I think that's an okay thing. I agree. It actually falls under that uh, umbrella of what we call self-fulfillment, right, Jeff, as it relates mm-hmm. to technical yeah. analysis? Yeah, yeah, so that's okay. Self-fulfillment being the idea that, quite simply, you're working with the same things that a lot of other traders are working with. And when we we see behaviors that are somewhat reliable, those behaviors become perhaps opportunities for us. Uh, Jeff, the movement in the NDX has been, and this is the NASDAQ 100, for those of you a little unfamiliar here, has been a little bit less consistent. We've had uh, a a few more uh, deviations below the 20-day, however, not terrible deviations by any stretch. Uh, If you are a follower of the so-called Horner rule, you've only had one instance where we had three consecutive closes below the 20-day, and then day four right here, we got right back above it. And if you were simply sitting on your hands waiting for this trade to recapture the 20 day on the NDX, you would have been fine because simply put, you've not been really uh, had a close below your entrance if you waited till that day, Jeff. But ultimately, a lot of the same stuff as it relates to the NDX here, right? 
And it's got to be a little bit stronger as you're looking at this trade versus the S&P 500. Those breaks below, they can really test your gusto. But I think you're absolutely right. Uh, other than that one time that you're pointing out right here, you've, you've had a couple closes. No, it doesn't feel great. But sure, that conviction can be strengthened over time. I, I'm, I, I'm thinking that probably there's some traders out there that say, well, you know what? I think I like the S&P 500 trade a little bit more than the NASDAQ trade right now. And hey, if your strategy says you go with whichever one has the stronger trend, there's nothing wrong with that. It's okay to switch from a NASDAQ trade to an S&P 500 trade or from an S&P 500 into a Dow trade. Yeah, I think what you're saying is ultimately it doesn't, your process can be whatever it is, just make sure that there's a plan behind it. What we don't want to do is start making uh, decisions on the fly, Jeff, hasty decisions, yeah. uh, chasing trades uh, without consideration for real risk. I think that's the challenge. Uh, so let's try and avoid that. Uh, there's a great question in the queue here uh, from Katya asking about if we are looking for new position, does that mean we should wait for a pullback to the 20 uh, moving average, 20 day moving average or whatever moving average we choose before buying? I think this is a great question. I'd, I'd love to pose it to you, Jeff. We, sure. we have the NDX. We could do this with the SPX. It really doesn't matter. The trends remain similar. But if you could just speak to that concept for a minute here about waiting maybe for the pullback as opposed to buying on uh, alternate opportunities. Sure. Well, I think a lot of traders out there do like to wait until that pullback happens to the viewer out there. And yes, that is a wonderful question. Waiting for that pullback, finding yourself a support as an entry, as opposed to waiting till you get to a resistance as an entry. Now, when you're looking at something like this and you go, well, we're hitting all time highs. What's the resistance? Kevin can show you and highlight the previous up leg and how you can use previous up movements to identify resistance points. But I think for the most part, traders out there do like to wait until you have a hit on that support level, essentially saying, let's find ourselves a floor. Once you have that floor established, great. I'm going to wait until we walk a day or two on that floor, and then I'm going to start to trickle in. Whether you scale in a whole bunch or you say, I, I just take the full position at that time, doesn't really matter. But the idea is, yes, there are a lot of traders out there who do wait for that walk along the floor before they enter into a new position. Mm -hmm. Kevin, can you expand upon that idea, though? As we're looking at this chart here, I noticed we're going higher on the chart, but as we're looking at that relative strength index down below, it seems yeah. to be losing some of that strength, giving a divergence. What might a trader think about in relation to that? Well, I mean, at this point, you're not, you are trading in a vicinity of highs. I mean, we are very close to highs, obviously. So a trader might look at the RSI and say, I'd prefer that it gives me confirmatory action, meaning we have the, the blue line above the 70 line. That would at least give some validation. But Jeff, if you've been using the RSI as a means to not enter the NDX anytime, dating all the way back to mid -jan late January, for example, Jeff, we would have lost out on a lot of opportunity here. I mean, 17.6, yeah. we've pushed up to 18.464. So, I mean, we've added 800 plus points in the NDX over just the last two and a half months. And if you were relying on RSI as your caveat signal or your uh, alternate signal here, you'd have been missing out on reasonable returns, I think. Um, so I think the reminder is, yes, the the RSI can be helpful in, in certain, certain circumstances, but overbought conditions and, um, and divergences in the midst of strong trends just don't seem to carry as much water uh, when the price action matters most. And I think that's the ultimate reminder, isn't it, Jeff? When we yeah. trade, what is the number one most fact, most important factor? It's price, always. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, very well said. Great question, too, by to, that viewer. Keep those but it's coming. hard to get to that, right? I mean, when you're, <laughs> you know, when you're thinking about it from a standpoint of, well, should I really deploy more money here? Of course, you know, some traders like to be buyers on breakouts. Some don't don't prefer that. Some don't have comfort for buying at higher prices. Um, the, the, le the thing I'll leave you with, Jeff, and ultimately is we've said it before. It's OK. It's great to be a, buy, a buyer at low prices and a seller at high prices. But it's also OK to be a buyer at high prices and a seller at even higher prices. Yeah, now, trend analysis that. is what that affords the trader to conceive of. Right. We have to be comfortable with trend and really believe in what we're witnessing in the trend to be a buyer at higher prices. So you, you've just got to believe uh, you have to you have to have seen it probably historically, Jeff. It's one thing to see it in a textbook or to have read through all your technical analysis uh, details at your fingertips. But until you've really, I love this term, I just, until you've seen it in the wild, 
on a chart <laughs> in reality while you're watching that stock do what you think it could do. It doesn't carry as much weight for us as traders, does it? I love that. We're going to have to find some sort of a saying now that includes in the wild and, and, and maybe some uh, neat little facets of that experience as we're talking about the market. Really cool. It's true. Um, I wanted to answer a question in the queue there from Jay about uh, the t think or swim setup here. You are right. A couple of these studies um, uh, that are not yet available in think or swim. One of them uh, is the uh, average volume over time. We had that in Street Smart Edge. That is a intra period study looking at volume at various times of the day versus the average of the prior five business days or trading days, for example. Uh, that's something we could. Um, that's something that is in the works as far as I'm aware. It's on our roadmap. Uh, and then there's the question of. Um, Price relative study, really just evaluating um, prices in a manner that is not specifically on the same chart, right, where you're doing an overlay of two different instruments. Um, I'm going to have to look into that one for you, everybody, uh, to get you the better answer on that, Jay. I don't know definitively. I believe we have a, uh, a specific study that would be akin to price relative, but I'm going to need to play with that a little bit. And so hopefully I have an answer for you there. And as uh, we are seeing in the queue there, just a reminder, we've got a uh, survey opportunity. We always appreciate your feedback on the surveys, everybody. If you've got comments you'd like to share as it relates to the, the Trader Talk um, format and everything, we'd love to hear that stuff from you. I review every one of those comments. So really helpful if you have an opportunity to do that. You can just click that link. It'll put it into a browser window up above for you, and you can just reside there until post-show. And then you can spend all of about two to four minutes for me uh, putting in a couple of answers to two specific questions. Okay. Uh, Jeff, with that, let's move off of the NDX. Let's jump over to the Russell. We've had a little bit of a nice move in the Russell. I'm going to have to eliminate some of my lines in here because we've made some additional pushes higher. And I just want to highlight what's been going on here. But, Jeff, it's been a pretty good move. Uh, the RUT taking us through that 2100 level late last week. What are your thoughts on what you're getting out of small caps here? Well, I think for, for, for a lot of folks out there, whether you're an investor meeting a long term, we'll talk a year or longer or a trader, somebody that's going less than a year, seeing the Russell doing what it's doing probably gives a little bit more confidence to the overall market movement. Before, let's call it two months ago or so, as the Russell was pulling back while the market was going higher, there was a lot of pundits out there that were saying, I just don't know about this. We'd really like to see the small caps leading the charge in a new bullish movement. And that just wasn't happening. But now as you're looking at the chart, as we saw earlier with the S&P 500 and with the NASDAQ, you've got bullish movements there. And now finally joining the party is the Russell 2000. So talking just to the bigger breadth of the overall market, this is probably a helpful bullish signal for those of you out there that were saying, well, I, I'd like to see a little bit more breadth coming from the market. You're finally now getting that. Now, the cool thing about what you're seeing on the Russell here, Kevin, is not only are you getting this new high, but if you look down, if you're an RSI trader, you're also seeing that's coming closer to some newer short-term highs. Very, very positive thing for a lot of traders that are wanting to get in that bullish camp on the small caps. So do you take a position right now? Do you not take a position right now? I'm not sure what the correct answer on that is, but I wouldn't be surprised if you start to see some traders out there that say, hey, once we get this break and a close or two above this 2130 or so level, mm -hmm. that's when I'm going to start taking on new positions. Because like we mentioned, we've broken past that ceiling and we are now finding a new floor. Somebody buying in on that floor is probably not a bad idea. But that's some of the things that are capturing my attention right now. What's on your slate? Well, not a bad idea if you are defining your risk and working with some sort of downside exit strategy. I'll agree with you there. Always, yeah, um, always. You know, there's, uh, I think a lot of traders are noting the uh, short term uptrend here from these gap moves. We've had a nice run off the 52 week low to 52 week high. Very big move all in all here in the RUT. Uh, some traders will make note of the fact that we just broke late last week that bull flag, right? We had a quick bull flag from here to here, and it went sideways for all of two and a half days. And then we busted out of it on Wednesday and broke even further on Thursday. Today, we're getting a little breather. But Jeff, this has been a ver vastly improving chart and a, a view of the weekly will highlight the ledge of resistance. And it's important to bring this up because, Jeff, as I add a little bit more time to my weekly chart, I'm going to go from three to five years, uh, it is pretty clear that this was 
a, a zone of support when we were going sideways back here in um, early 21 to mid 21, uh, basically for all of 21, as it turns out, uh, 2021. And then we fell through it. And what once was support, Jeff, clearly became resistance. And we are right back at that level. And so, you know, some traders who have want to be bullish, admittedly, you know what? This is a spot of note for us all. Uh, this is a spot where we could get rejected. We have to make note of that. Uh, it doesn't mean we can't break through it. In fact, what it means, I think, Jeff, is if we did break through it, it would be pretty darn significant. Well, yeah, and yeah, I think you're right. Careful about getting ahead of your skis. For the folks out there that are saying, oh, I, I like to take early positions, great. If you're going to do that, maybe make sure you're just scaling into that position. Take 5% of your total 100% position or take 10% or maybe 25%. I, I think I'm with, with Kevin on this one. I'd be a little bit hesitant to jump all in on the position right now and say, yes, we are going to break through and hold that previous resistance level as our new support. But I would not be opposed to seeing somebody saying, well, let me take 5% or 10% of that overall position. See what it does over the next couple of days. If you can get a move higher, great. Then you start to trickle in a little bit more after that. There is nothing wrong with scaling in and scaling out of your positions. This does not have to be an all or none game. That's exactly the way I feel, Jeff. I'm a believer in the idea that utilizing uh, portional entry, scaling, as you called it, into the position. If it goes in your favor, you add a little bit more. If it continues in your favor, you feel comfortable, you add more. Uh, this is just as much as anything. Yeah, it's a proper, tr it can be a proper trade management technique, but the reason it can be proper for us is it aids us in managing our own emotions on the trade. By starting small, you tend to be able to allow more wiggle room. Oh, I only own five shares, so if it dropped 10 points, I'm down 50 bucks. I can manage that. Uh, you know, Again, do the math on this. I think scaling works very well for the trader who needs to, to manage their own emotions. It's what got me to a comfort zone, Jeff. Uh, initially, as a trader, I was bogged down by the idea that I needed to be fully invested all the time or fully invested yeah. in 100 share lots. And really, that was my mistake. I, it didn't it did. It gave me no consistency. And so instead of viewing everything from a standpoint of how many shares I needed to own, I shifted over to dollars. And here's how much do how many dollars I am comfortable deploying to any one position in my portfolio. And if that you know started out as small, 5,000, I would generally look at it as, hey, okay, here's my first leg. It's a thousand dollar leg. And I have five opportunities to add to it and I can always take it off. But ultimately by starting small, it just allowed the stock or the market to do more of what it needs to do. And it forced me to step back a little bit, Jeff. I find that if for those of us, especially in the first few years of figuring out trading, if you're watching the market every single day, Jeff, it can just be yeah. a boatload of noise. <laughs> it certainly can. And it's never a dull moment either. That's something to remember too. For the viewers <laughs> out there that have been doing this for a lot of years like Kevin and I have, there are going to be news stories that are constantly going to test your strategy. It is oh, going yeah. to be very, very difficult some days to focus on your long-term goals and sticking to your plan and staying with your process. But I agree with you completely, big guy. The thing about when you're getting into and out of a trade is not an all or none, but that's something that some of us learn quicker than others. It also took me a few years to learn that as well, because I was saying, well, do I buy it today? Is today the day that I get in there? doesn't yeah. have to be a single day. It can be a few days over the course of a couple of weeks, over the course of a couple of months. So it's all right to scale into and out of your positions. I hope that's a good pullback from the viewers. Yeah, I think so too, Jeff. I'm, I'm just a, a found that it worked well for my own management. And hey, if, if there's another method that you're employing that's giving you as a trader comfort and allows you to be properly invested and manage the day-to-day -day machinations and the uh, the noise, so to speak, and focus better on the longer trend. Because remember, the longer a trend is in play, the more likely that trend is to continue. Of course, we know that all trends end. They always break at some point. Uh, the key is how do we get into that trend, maintain it, and stay with the trend along the way, uh, but also make sure that we're comfortable. And I think this is maybe, Jeff, a great opportunity just to kind of migrate or segue over to our existing example portfolio and look through a couple of positions and really hit our learning objectives. So let's do that here. Let's start out with the monitor tab. 
So we can quickly just take a peek at what we've got. We've got a decent portfolio here. We do have um, about seven individual equities. Percentage-wise, we're up a collective 13.5% excuse me, on our example portfolio here. A couple of call-outs. One, we've got stocks in various groups. Jeff, this is kind of notable, isn't it? We've got happen to have a couple of energy stocks. We have a discretionary, a staple, a services, communication services, an industrial, a tech, so and a financial. So the only reason I bring this up, this was not by um, accident necessarily. Our goal has always been to provide a process that can that many traders will incorporate. And one of those concepts, Jeff, is to ensure that you're not over-investing in any one group, even as a trader, right? Because any given day of the week, if you've only invested in tech stocks, boy, you could have a rough day at any moment, right? And very quickly too, because that concentrated position, while it can be wonderful when it's going your direction, it can be disastrous if it starts to turn against you. So I love that call out, Kevin. Having a diversified portfolio, even in a trading space, not necessarily a bad thing. So uh, in terms of management here, everybody, I'm just going to uh, do a couple of things. I'm going to kick us over to our chart. And what I have done, I'm just going to give you guys some insights as to how I'm managing this. I have gone ahead up here to this, this little queue, and I have uh, detached this window. I've placed it on my laptop monitor for myself. And you'll notice I've got my icons here, right? This number five, which tells me that if I just click that five, it's going to populate any other tool in Thinkorswim Desktop with that same icon is going to get populated with that. And so I'm going to go to my chart, and here I've got the five. And now I'm going to jump back over to my individual page that you all can't see, but I'm just going to click through the five. And now I'm going to see my individual positions. Okay, so here's Slumberger, which, Jeff, we bought way back when, but it has finally broken out a little bit and pushed over the 200-day moving average with a little bit of a hold. And, you know, this is one that some traders might look to raise a general stop a traditional stop, but we have been employing the use of the average true range down below as a means okay. of uh, incorporating kind of the volatility of Schlumberger with our downside risk. A lot of traders looking at that blue 200-day moving average, so we use the ATR to come beneath the moving average by the amount of the average true range. That's why our stop is where it is. Do you have any reason to think you should we should be looking to raise that stop on this one? Well, we've got that pull back and then up. I don't know when the position was taken, but that pull back just before that nice big green candle, that mm -hmm. touch right there of the 200 would lead me to believe that that 200 is probably getting a lot of attention from the traders out there. So as I understand, let me make sure I've got this with the rest of the viewers. You are taking that 200 period simple moving average and saying, let's go down below that by the average true range. And then somewhere in that spot is where we're sticking our stop. Is that correct? Exactly right. Just to give okay. us a little bit more wiggle room. That's all. Gotcha. Well, I, I like that plan. And so are we getting any further away now that we've moved up a little bit? Is there anything that would give us less comfort as I asked rhetorically? I don't know. I, I don't know that we've come across another new support level. That's generally when traders will adjust those stops is when you find yeah. a new support level at a higher price. What are your thoughts, Kevin? Yeah, I think you're right. Maybe a, a continuation breakout of the most recent move here. So if we mm -hmm. popped through, if I just copied this line here, I'll duplicate it and move it. So if we got through here on a closing basis, for example, some traders would say, all right, maybe now we can raise the stop to at least the 200 ledge uh, or just below it, maybe even incorporating there's a nice tail here that got mm -hmm. below the 200. Maybe that extended low becomes the stop spot. You're not capturing a whole lot of additional profit if you would go that way. And let's just remind ourselves that we know these stop orders, of course, if they trigger at our stop price, they become market orders. So we can't verify, guarantee that price, of course. With a market order, we could be executed at any price, everybody. So we have that risk associated with it. Um, but that's one thing that traders might be looking at. Hey, maybe this can continue higher. As is often the case, though, Jeff, I'm going to encourage traders to lean into the same things as always. Where's your comfort? You know, what do you think can happen? And what if the worst case scenario happens? Are you do you have the right number of shares invested? Right. These are some of the questions I like to ask myself. Yeah, well, I like to do what, what you almost hear from a viewer perspective and from a trader perspective is, gosh, I just hear the same thing over and over and over again. 
Yeah, that's because we're following a strict set of rules. We are trying our best as traders to follow what has worked for other traders. And that is a process. And so if you have a great process, you're going to keep saying the same things over and over again. Price is what's important. The trend is your friend until it bends. Make sure the volume is confirming the overall trend. Things like this. <laughs> they, they are constantly being reiterated because they are what constantly has shown to work for the vast majority of successful traders out there. So it's, yeah. it's very normal to think, gosh, I just hear the same things over and over again. I'm writing down the same stuff on my notepad. That's normal. That is okay. Absolutely. And it's not to say that these processes are the ones to work with. What it is to say is that we as traders need to develop those processes. You can start with ideas that other traders are incorporating, but then get to your true comfort. Change things up. Find what it is about the market and the way the market moves that you react to and that makes your decision making easy. That's ultimately what you're getting to. Whatever that is for you is where you want to be. Okay, That's what we should be striving for. Um, all right, Jeff. So we're going to leave Schlumberger uh, alone there. Let's take a look at Visa. We've got a position with a stop. That position is up about nine and a half percent currently. As we often say, Jeff, we are not interested in reducing our stop. And some traders would look at this and say, oh, no, I'm in danger of being stopped out. I need to lower my stop. We don't do that, Jeff. No, oh boy. No, please don't. You do not want to loosen your stop and turn a 10 percent loss into a 15 or 20 percent loss you keep those stops where they're at if anything you only tighten them that is a good habit to get into i think for a lot of traders but yeah as you're getting close to this i'm sure a lot of the people who saw this trade when you first put it on are thinking oh, oh uh, this isn't looking good kevin should we sell out of this right now before this starts to happen what does the plan say what does your process yeah. say and and it looks like your process says we stay in this that's probably a good thing to note for those traders out there that say, I've got something that's hitting against a support level. In this case, it looks like that's the 50. When that touches that support level, it is not a sign that you sell out of it. It could strictly be the market testing support, giving strength to the bullish thesis, and it's mm -hmm. going to continue going higher. So just because something is touching a stop or a support level, rather, does not mean you want to sell out of it at that point in time. That is true. I need to answer a question from Chuck about uh, the 200 share position. Is that the full position in Slumberger? No, it is not. Thank you for asking. For those of you who've been watching the show frequently, we actually last week incorporated a uh, sell stop, excuse me, a sell to open position on option uh, to basically come into an, a contract, agree to a contract where we would sell or deliver shares of uh, Slumberger at a $55 strike price. Uh, now, that is not that is on the table here, so to speak. That's a trade that is on already. If I took us back to the monitor tab, you'll see it right here. So there we are. We have that short one contract at the $55 strike price. Let me open that up. So oh, there it is, so 55. Okay, so that was a conversation last week around how to conceive of exiting your position without selling stock. In this case, just entering into an agreement to sell at 55 if the other side of our contract wants to buy it. So I just wanted to confirm that for you. Now, Jeff, the, the real position we wanted to look at today was on Disney. And the reason is that here on Disney, Jeff, we had made a recent change. We had been employing a traditional stop. And this is really the learning objective, the meat of our conversation today, everybody, was the idea of a discussion around traditional stops versus trailing stops. And we employed a trailing stop order, which is set now to have uh, basically states, if you drop four points from the, from the regular recession intraday highs or any high, if it drops by four points, we are wanting to be stopped out. And remember, the trailing stop has that same risk factor that the traditional does, but Jeff, this one ratchets higher as price goes higher. So some traders really like this idea because it will work to capture additional gains if the trend is really strong and continues to push higher. Essentially, if we never drop by four points from the high, well, then you'll never be stopped out of this trade. However, we expect that'll happen at some point. But Jeff, what is the trouble with a trade like this? If I zoomed in, showing where the thirty dollar, or excuse me, our exit strategy on the thirty shares is right now, what is the risk for us as traders here? You know, why would a trader maybe want to utilize a traditional in lieu of this trailing stop, perhaps? A really good question. The hard part I find that a lot of traders have with the trailing stop is that. 
Nobody else is looking at your trailing stop. When you're incorporating a regular stop, it's generally going to be based off of a support or a resistance, whether it be derived from some, some trend line that you've drawn on there or from some simple moving average, maybe some exponential moving averages. Other people can see what you're looking at, but when you're losing, when you're using a trailing stop, in that case, there's nothing else out there that says, oh, this is where this is going to find a support level, or this is why this and X, Y, and Z. So that's one of the difficulties, I think, when you're using a trailing stop is you're not getting other people's eyes on that trade. So you don't really have the sure. confirmation mechanism that you do with a regular stop. Uh, the other thing, and I think this goes to both of them, Kevin, correct me if I'm wrong, but in either the regular stop or the trailing stop example, once it is violated and a trade occurs at or below that price, both of them go out to market, which can be yep. okay if it's trading and it happens during the regular trading session. But if it happens right. overnight and you're not using a trailing stop or a regular stop, doesn't that have a potential to have a dramatic drop in the next morning's action? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what if what if we finished right where we are right now and we have the stop where we do right here at what is it, 119.74? If it opened tomorrow at 108, guess what? Our execution is going to be very close to 108, not very close to 119. <laughs> yeah, we have that risk. You're absolutely right. But what about this, Jeff? What if I was a believer in the strength of this recent move, having broken out of a what some would call a nice, clean, ascending triangle, right? If I'll just redraw that, so something like this. You know, some traders might say, or, or we had a range that we broke out of, and it's been trending beautifully. And it really has, whether it's a manually drawn trend line, or what if we went with a very fast, like a 10-day moving average? Let me just add the 10-day on there. So the 10-day is kind of close. So here's the 10-day. It's at 118.17. That means that a trader at using our traditional, our trailing stop in this example at 119.74, Jeff, what happens if we get taken out at 119.74 only to tag or kiss, if you will, the 10-day moving <laughs> average and then hold it so that we don't break down? That means that yeah. the trader got stopped out before we had a confirmed test of the current short-term trend. So you might be out of this trade before the trend breaks. Not everybody's a fan of that, Jeff. And some traders want to stick with the trend until it legitimately breaks. In this case, the trailing stop might kick you out before the trend breaks. And that means if you wanted to be in it again, you'd have to be prepared and ready to jump right back into the position if it gets back in gear for you, Jeff. Yeah. So what about that? What if you're watching Trader Talk and you go, well, they went from a regular stop into a trailing stop. And now I'm hearing them talk about going possibly back to a regular stop. What are your thoughts on that? Could you highlight that? Well, I don't mind moving things around a little bit or, or altering your decision making, just having a good good reasoning for it. If you're if you can if you can um, if you can define your process, everything's fine as far as I'm concerned. And further, if you can be entirely comfortable with the risk factors associated with the amount of shares you're sticking with, well, then you're in good shape as well. However, um, I, I don't like the idea of frequently manipulating or changing between trail and <laughs> traditional. I think sometimes we have to set a course of action and then stick with it. And then we learn from that action after the fact, Jeff, that's kind of the way that I would lean into it. What, what about you? I, I like that. Yeah. I, th I think okay. you gotta be careful about saying, well, I'm, I'm going to go with this. And, and actually, you know what, now I'm going to go with this. And I was right the first time. That's yeah. you second guessing yourself more often exactly. than following a process. And that's really not what you want to do. Yeah. I, I appreciate you making that note. I, I agree with you. I think that makes a lot of sense. So while, you know, again, what we want to remind everybody about today is that stop orders are tools that traders will utilize to aid in trying to reduce risk. We know they're not perfect. We can't guarantee that they will reduce your risk or limit your risk to a certain amount, but we work with them because for the majority of transactions, they do go the way that we expect. We do have overnight risk, gap risk, 
These are things we have to be aware of, but it's a great reminder about what we traders are looking for. We build our decision making on the probabilities that the market offers us, and then we incorporate those probabilities to determine how much of a deployment should we make at any given moment in time. 100% of my investable dollars, 20% because I'm less confident, so on. These are things you need to be considering in our eyes, everybody. So that's the discussion for you today. Jeff, as always, love having you on the show here on a Monday. Thank you so much for joining us today. Truly my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me and happy April 1st. Absolutely. Same to you. And everybody, just a quick heads up. Um, I'm going to be on uh, extended vacation for a while coming up uh, the beginning of next week, which means you're going to be seeing more from our regional investment strategist on Monday. Uh, but not to worry, we've got you coming covered in terms of trader talk for every day of the week as usual so make sure you tune in here we would love your feedback on that survey everybody take a moment to complete that for us don't forget to follow me on x you can do that at kevin horner cs and our man brent moores you can follow him on x as well at brent moores cs hit that thumbs up if you got something out of today's conversation don't forget to subscribe to the channel as well I want to thank you all for joining us today everybody hope you all have a fantastic monday we'll see you again real soon